something I have never done before in my life. And what I learned is that being told what it's like to run into a burning building and actually doing it are two very different things. Grabbing a hose and running into a burning building is not something I ever really wanted to do. When I got the chance, I found out why. Good. This is DC Fire Ops 101. For one day, DC Fire and EMS gave a lucky few, like Mayor Mariel Bowser, an opportunity to be a first responder. It produces a lot of anxiety. A lot. No, nope. you're fine. The day started with medical tests and equipment fitting. Yep. Good to go. After a quick pep talk. If you're not nervous, then you're not safe. We were ready. Our first scenario was to rescue a cardiac patient. Other simulations involved extractors and breaking down doors. But by far, the most intense was the burn building. When I got inside, that's me in front, everything went dark. All I could see was my lieutenant's reflector until it vanished. I didn't know who or what was around me. I just followed the voices. Hey, get down low, get down low. Amongst the sounds and uncertainties, a mild panic began to set in. But when I found that fire, my thoughts cleared. My helmet camera struggled to adjust to the light. Do not want to hear that noise. As I inched into the room, intense heat ran down my back. Once in place, I aimed and pulled the lever. Wow. You actually cannot see anything except for the fire. You don't know if there's holes in the floor. You don't know where the step ends, tripping over things. It's just more intense than I thought it would be. I also learned from Lieutenant James Gordon it was less intense than the real thing. Honest to goodness, those timbers, there's nothing wrong we do with the real life. Not one person in this group bailed out or, or gave up. Awesome, awesome. So if you guys are all healthy and good, we need to put the hose back on the fire truck. Our job's not over. Voting twice is illegal, but earlier this month during the midterm election, I learned it's easy to do. Can I have your picture ID? Like many Americans, every November, I vote. My permit gets me my ballot. I take it seriously. Fill it out, go to the scanner. But last year, after moving to Virginia, I learned our voting system has some serious flaws. I registered my ballot, got my sticker, now I'm going to go see if I can vote again. Two hours later, I was at my old polling place in Pennsylvania, where I haven't lived in a year. By state law, recording is not allowed in polling places. So I'm going to go in and see if I'm still registered. Well, I gave the election clerk my name. She pulled it up. I easily could have just voted twice. This is one of the biggest problems that you face. Right, it is. Linda Lindbergh is a director of elections in Arlington. When I registered at her office, I signed this document stating I was previously registered in another state. That form was then put in an envelope, lick stamped, and mailed to Pennsylvania. It's a bit antiquated, this system, in a modern world. This process, Lindbergh says, cannot keep pace with our increasingly mobile lives. In her election office, like many others, paper is still king. A lot can go wrong. That's a big problem in, in the integrity of our voter rolls. Chris Kobach is the Kansas Secretary of State. There's a huge amount of inaccuracy. Kobach operates the Interstate Cross Check, a collection of 28 states that share voter rolls. In 2014, the Cross Check found 7.3 million voters were registered in multiple states, 339,000 in Virginia, 44,000 just between Maryland and Virginia. Kobach says this inaccuracy increases the possibility of voter fraud. In his state in 2014, more than 100 people, a record, appeared to vote twice. You look at the, uh, the larger group of, of 28 states, you know, it, and do the math, we're talking about thousands of double votes. No, it just doesn't happen. Voting twice is illegal. With heavy fines and possible jail time, Allegra Chapman with Common Cause downplays this impact. But she does agree with Kobach. The system needs to be modernized. Everything we do is so tech-based, and so it just makes sense that we should be modernizing our election system to come into the 21st century. Not too many kids for their fifth birthday get their own fire suit, but not too many kids have a story like William Brooks. 
The morning of March 29th, 2014, a tremendous fire ripped through this row home on Stevens Road Southeast with dozens of firefighters on scene. It was a hot fire. Lieutenant James Gordon rushed inside looking for victims. I just went in the bedroom and found William in there unconscious. Do you think he was dead? Yeah. With William in his arms, Gordon rushed through the flames towards a waiting ambulance. The boy's grandmother and a family friend lay dead inside. His severely burned mother had jumped out a window, breaking her leg. I don't remember anything because I passed out. I kind of panicked a little bit. No one should have made it out. How much longer do you think he would have had before you got him? It wouldn't have been much longer. Oftentimes, this is where the story ends, but not here. Shortly after the fire, Lieutenant Gordon went to the hospital to meet the boy he saved. It's like something you would never think would happen. But then the outcome of it was like something you never think would happen. Since this moment in the hospital, William and Gordon have built a relationship few can truly understand. They boat together, ride four-wheelers, attend ball games, and go to the movies. Last week, they even went to the White House. Gordon's not in this picture. He's taking it. He always going to be my best friend. For William, Lieutenant Gordon has become an inspiration. What do you want to be when you grow up? Five, five. In William, Gordon sees himself. When he was nine, he was pulled from a fire, which inspired him. Captain who pulled me out, he was actually my chief when I started there. So maybe someday I'll be William's chief. A maybe. They could be just 13 birthdays away. That's why I want to be a firefighter, because they're great and never give up and help people. Chris Pabst, ABC 7 News. Oh, man, what a story. <laughs> Panic has set in at a Fairfax County police station after an alarming number of the employees there, including police officers, have been diagnosed with cancer. Employees tell Seven on Your Side investigator Chris Papps the department and the county have not done enough to find out why this is happening. I've never been more afraid of dying in my life. For 16 years, Steve Zakos worked the streets of Fairfax County as a police officer. But it's the work he did inside the Franconia police station that scared him most. It's a 23-year-old building that's recently earned a chilling nickname. The Franconia Cancer Station. Seven on your side has learned at least 13 people who work here within the past five years have battled cancer, all of them under the age of 50. Three have already died. I don't think that it's just a coincidence. Catherine McGowan buried her mother last June. Officer Sally McGowan worked here for 15 years. She was 45. If my mom was still alive, she would be the one up here saying that, you know, it's time to get out. We want transparency. We want the station tested. We want the personnel tested. We need to know. Last July, the department did test air and water. Seven on your side obtained those results, which called for, quote, no corrective action. But radon, a known carcinogen, was not tested, even though Fairfax County has high levels. Benzene, a leading airborne carcinogen found in gasoline, was also not tested. This is the I-team found a cluster of 12 confirmed leaking underground gas tanks surrounding Franconia. It's plausible that these could be a cluster related to the building. Dr. Don Milton studies public health at the University of Maryland. He says while testing is important, a broader investigation looking at types of cancer and patient medical histories is needed. Cancer clusters are the hardest kinds of investigations to do. An investigation we've learned has just begun. This is of grave concern to me. Edwin Rossler is the Fairfax County Police Chief. He spoke to us with the County Health Director by his side. But as of right now, this is the only station that you perceive to have a problem. That's a correct statement, yes. With mounting concern, the county has recently stepped up its efforts to solve this mystery. Patient medical records are now being analyzed. Possible toxins associated with police equipment, like vests or gun belts, are also being studied. And three days before Chief Rossler agreed to sit down with us, he sat down with all of his Franconia employees to address their grave concerns. I've lost uh, good friends to cancer, some of which have worked at the station, and I'm going to try to do everything I can to determine whether or not there's a problem. 
Hi, Chris. You have one there. Yes, we have one right here. This is the Lego version of the drone. It's a little difficult to, to command, but it's, it's going to try to make its way back over here. Now, the FAA says that it has made this registration process as easy as possible. So let's try to walk you through it. First, just go to FAA.gov. This is the main website. This is their home page. Register your UAS, Unmanned Aerial System. Click on that. It brings you to this page and just click on registration. And then this gives you all the information that you need to be able to register your drone and what the rules are. And it is kind of neat. This thing can just hover right here, right next to me, a little Lego guy on the top. So the rules are you must be 13 years of age or older, a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident. If your drone weighs less than 0.55 pounds, which ours does, you do not need to register it. So our drone here would not need to be registered. If it weighs more than 55 pounds, then that's a different type of registration. If you register within 30 days, you're, you will get a refund of the $5 that it will cost you after that 30-day period. And when you register, you'll get a certificate and a number. You put that number onto your drone, so when you're flying it outside, you're flying it legally. And also remember, when you fly one of these outside, and this one would be an exception because it's under 0.55 pounds, you do not, you have to fly it under 400 feet of altitude. It must be in your line of vision the entire time. And also remember to check no fly zones around airports. Here at Reagan, for example, you are not allowed to fly any drone within 30 miles of Reagan National Airport, even if you go through this process and it's registered. Live in the newsroom with our drone, Chris Paps, ABC 7 News. You know, I admire you for putting your nose and ears at risk like that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, man.